est, qui est la dernière, euh, parce que les chercheurs du Mozambique, professeur Joël Tembe, l'ancien directeur des archives nationales du Mozambique, ne pouvait pas venir. Il ne peut pas se connecter. Donc, on va unir euh, toutes les présentations qu'il nous reste. Il y en a quatre, tout, toutes les quatre interventions dans un même panel. Et puis, on va avoir une discussion finale et finir, conclure notre réunion qui était jusqu'ici, je, je crois, très stimulante. Et elle a déjà accompli ce but. So I will now uh, use my English. So uh, let me welcome you. Let me welcome Professor Jan van der Smissen from the University of Ghent in Belgium and uh, the director of the Belgian committee of the project Fontes Historie Africanae. The Belgian committee of this project is one of the most important one. So I am very happy that uh, Mr. van der Smissen uh, find his time as a busy university teacher and uh, he came uh, to share uh, his uh, knowledge with us and he will present us the Belgium committee. Thank you very much. Um, D'abord, je veux m'adresser aux organisateurs euh, pour le magnifique accueil et le chaleureux accueil que nous avons eu ici euh, à Tunis, dans cette magnifique maison de la sagesse. Euh, et je remercie aussi euh, les deux coordinateurs de, de notre rencontre pour toutes les préparations euh, de, de de ce magnifique programme, la composition de ce magnifique programme. Je vais m'adresser à vous en anglais. Um, I represent here the uh, Belgian Royal Academy for Overseas Sciences, um, of which I had the privilege of being the president in 2019. That was also the first time we met uh, at the Academy in Paris. Um, for um, um, a meeting on the Fontes, and uh, since then our own committee uh, at the Royal Academy for Overseas Sciences has a little bit evolved, and since then I am also the coordinator of that um, committee. Fontes Historia Africana is based on a long tradition of uh, intellectual cooperation and solidarity, which is rooted in research in the human sciences. And it was already, as you heard last year, uh, last uh, yesterday, sorry, um, uh, it was already founded in 1962 as a collection under uh, the Union Académique Internationale. Um, and since then, it has um, reinforced uh, the awareness on two major facts. First, that African historiography needs an African perspective, and second, that the widest possible access in several languages should be given to primary sources that are still unknown or difficult to consult. And although, as with any long-term project, there have been difficult times, the collection of published titles, as abundant as it is var varied, amply illustrates uh, the enormous intellectual efforts made as well as the relevance of the undertaking. And one way say that the Fontes series has helped to fill a gap by providing scholars and researchers with a wealth of primary sources that offer insight into the complexity and diversity of African societies and cultures. The Fontes original intention had been to publish documents relating to the history of Africa prior to the 1850s. And in this perspective, it is hardly surprising that documents in Arabic constitute a very important um, whole of volumes published in the first decades of um, the series existence. The Belgian series of Fontes Historia Africani only started in the early 21st century. The Royal Academy for Overseas Science of Belgium is very proud to be a partner in this project, alongside the many other venerable institutions that contribute to it. To this date, the Belgian series focus 
has been mainly on sources of Congolese or Central African origin, which were often created in a colonial context. Let us take a closer look at Belgian involvement in the Fantes project. Um, it was in um, 1997 that our late colleague, Viera Pavlikova Villanova, uh, from the Institute of Oriental Studies of the Slovak Academy of Sciences, was appointed as the international director of Fantes. As soon as she took office, she stressed the importance of developing the project's national committees, uh, more particularly regarding Germany, France, Portugal, and Belgium. And this is how, and I learned it a few minutes ago, also uh, through the uh, mediation of uh, the UAE, um, the Académie Royale de Belgique uh, was involved in the project and was seized of the problem of Belgian participation in the Fantes series and suggested that the Royal Academy for Overseas Sciences of Belgium, so a second academy which I represent, assume the responsibility for it. And this was done in the year 2000 under the chairmanship of our late colleague uh, Jean Stengers, a historian of the Université Libre de Bruxelles, specialized both in Belgian political and dynastical history and in the history of the Congo Free State and Belgian Congo. And he shared also the membership of both academies. The first Belgian Fontes committee was composed of the following academy members. You have and still have uh, John Everard. Uh, he was my mentor at uh, University of Ghent, a historian of pre-modern European colonization. The late John Jacobs, uh, an ethnologist, former director of the Seminar for African Language and Literature, also at Ghent University, specialized in Tetela language and cosmology. The late Pierre Salmon, a sociologist from the Université Libre de Bruxelles, but also a visiting professor at the universities of Lumumbashi and of Bujumbura. The late Jan van Sina, probably well known uh, uh, in Africanist circles, historian and anthropologist, former director of the Institut pour la Recherche Scientifique en Afrique Centrale, and a professor at various universities, Lovanium University, Catholic Universiteit Leuven, um, and finally, a research professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he stimulated the African Studies program and further developed his rational methods for writing African history based on oral traditions. Also member, the historian Jean-Luc Vellut, professor at the Université Catholique de Louvain, also at University of Kinshasa and at the University of Lumumbashi. He was, he is, uh, still is a very um, active um, specialist in the field of West Central African history, focused on Congo, but also on Angola. And, find, and then we have also, and I will speak about uh, his contribution later, uh, Hon Honoré Vink, a former Catholic missionary, director of the Equatoria Research Center in Mbandeka, and founder and editor-in-chief of the Anal Equatoria, a specialist on the history of education in Belgium, Congo. And finally, Jacques van der Linden, a law expert specialized in the history of African law systems, professor at the Université de Bruxelles, and also um, uh, worked in Canada. He coordinated the Belgian series for many years. We also had uh, the active support of the uh, permanent secretaries of the academies. Uh, I want to mention particularly uh, Professor Jola Verhasselt, a geographer specialized in the development ge geography in Africa and Latin America, a uh, professor at Vrije Universiteit Brussel, the permanent, former permanent secretary Daniel Swinne, who was a biolog who is a biologist specialized in medical mycology, who worked in Africa and thought at the Institute of for Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, but who uh, both as permanent secretaries uh, firmly supported the project from the start. The problem that could have arisen from for the Belgian Fontes Committee was that of the sources to be published, given the chrono chronological limits placed on the undertaking since its origins. However, this obstacle has since been removed by allowing a much broader time perspective.
Similarly, if the publication of official documentation relating to the Belgian Congo seemed to have been generally and systematically excluded, nothing seemed to prevent the publication of documents of private or public origin, provided on the one hand that they mainly concern Congolese actors in society, and on the other hand, uh, only call on the official documents of the European colonizer in a complementary way. In any event, as one can read in the introduction to the first volume uh, published by the Belgian Committee, the members had some difficulty in defining precise limits in this respect. The first volume in the Belgian series appeared in 2005 and was edited by Jean-Luc Vellut under the title Simon Kimbangu, 1921, de la prédication à la déportation, les sources. It is devoted to archival documents relating to the preaching of Simon uh, Kimbangu from its beginnings to the trial of the prophet and wonder worker and his deportation to Katanga. Of course, colleague Velut never had the ambition to publish all sources in this, on this subject. The general principle adopted was to gather for publication the unpublished and published sources which were produced, whether at the same time or possibly later, by actors, witnesses of the events surrounding the preaching and condemnation of Simon Kimbangu. In addition, only sources that had not previously appeared in a recent source publications were retained. So direct testimonials were of paramount importance. In this volume, the emphasis is on sources developed in the context of Protestant missionary activity, in particular by the Swedish Missionary Alliance. An important category of documents is constituted by the testimonies of Congo evangelists of the Alliance put in writing at the invitation of missionaries, sometimes after the events. In 2010, Jean-Luc Vellut again focused on the addition of Protestant sources that testify to the prophetic wave initiated by Simon, Simon Kimbangu in 1921. Baptist sources, both uh, English and North American, are the main element. But they have been supplemented by documents coming in particular from the evangelical ecumenical movement in the early 1920s, and which also contain direct evidence of Christian prophetism in the Congo. Finally, in 2015, Jean-Luc Vellu concluded his impressive oeuvre on Simon Kimbangu by editing a volume devoted to Catholic sources, in particular the Pontifical, Redemptorist, Jesuit, uh, Scutist and Spiritan sources completed with some documents produced by women's congregations. The three volumes together constitute a major work of learning. As one review underlined, the comparison of Protestant and Catholic missions and their principles with African syncretic movements to which these three volumes uh, invite is of particular interest. For although theologists and principles may differ, the circumstances of situations on the ground and the predilections of each missionary may exert influence. Valid, valid overview of sources still forms a stepping stone for further research on Kimbanguism and messianic movements in Central Africa. A second project was launched by our colleague Jacques van der Linde. In 2007, when he published the first volume of Main d'oeuvre, Église, Capitale et Administration dans le Congo des années 30, a work that focuses on the economic and social transition uh, in the Belgian Congo in the post Leopoldian period. Um, he, it was halfway through the central period of Belgian colonization in Africa that in the 1930s, the Belgian government decided to send a mission to the Congo to examine the labor problems which were arising in the colony. Concern about this in colonial circles was old. Labor constituted one of the pillars of classical political economy, along with natural resources provided by the soil and subsoil of the colony and capital provided by the colonizer. After an interpolation by the socialist representative Emile van der Velde in the Belgian chamber on the 25th of March 1930, a study mission was set up composed of four people, including Pierre Rickmans. 
This had to make, they had to make an inventory of labor problems in the Congo Kasai province, where there were serious issues to be investigated in palm plantations. A first group of documents presented by van der Linden is formed by the correspondence Pierre Rigmans exchanged with his wife. It constitutes, beyond the fact that the problem of labor is omnipresent there, an excellent introduction to the econo economic and social life in the Congo Kasai province. The second batch of documents is taken from the private archives of Pierre Rigmans. Rigmans. They testify to his efforts in his delicate and complex attempt to arbitrate between the ideas of two senior officials of the company Willery du Congo Belge. Very diverse in their origin, their nature, and their importance, they go to the heart of the problem and constitute the central part of the volume. In 2014, Jacques van der Linden published a second volume of the sources, the personal archives of Lord Lugard, deposited in Oxford at the Bodleian Library of Commonwealth and African Studies at Rhodes House. These contain, among other things, a large fund relating to the Villery du Congo Belge in the direction of which Lugard played, at the time, a capital role as chairman of the board of directors. With his two-volume work, Jacques van der Linden added a major contribution to our understanding of the relations between labor and the triad of church, capital, and administration in the Congo in the 1930s. Father Honoré Vink, for his part, edited in 2011 the full text of a 1954 survey of land tenure and disputes in the Belgian Congo, where Congolese opinions are at the forefront. The published sources are of two kinds. A first batch of documents comes from the Archive Equatoria in Bamania Mbandaka, a second from the Archive des Missionnaires du Sacré-Cœur in Borgerhout, Belgium, near Antwerp. They are supplemented by some documents from official and private archives. Moreover, magazines and newspapers in African and other languages are explored. Many sources are in Lomongo and have been translated for publication, but the core is formed by answers to questionnaires. Two Belgian missionaries, the linguist Father Gustav Hulstacht, an expert in Lomongo dialectology, and linguist and cultural scientist Father Edmond Boulart, had intensively distribute, distributed surveys in the Mbandaka area to better document their interventions in several land tenure disputes in the region where their congregation was active. They explicitly focused on the local population to fully grasp the problem of land ownership in Congo in all its dimensions, and thus help both the Congolese, the researchers who worked on the problem, and the administrative managers within the colonial government who had to make decisions. A specific problem is that in many surveys, the respondents used proverbs, some of them with a typical legal origin. Specialized studies in Mongo proverbs were used for their translation. Father Vink's edition is preceded by a very extensive erudite introduction to the history of the land tenures in Congo from the early Leopoldian era up to the Congo to the independence of Congo. As a result of which, this source publication has also become an enlightening historical study. By 2015, the Belgian Committee had published six volumes. In other words, it followed a publication rhythm of approximately one volume every two years. However, this was followed by a pause of several years, mainly due to the death of several members of the committee. Thanks in part to the efforts of the new permanent secretary, Philippe Goyens, a specialist in pediatrics, emeritus head of the Queen Fabiola Children's Hospital in Brussels, visiting professors uh, at Université Libre de Bruxelles, but also an ardent promoter of historical research uh, within the Royal Academy for Overseas Science of Belgium. Several new members joined the committee. Historian Anne Cornet, specialized in history of health and gender studies, uh, conducts research on colonial history at the Royal Museum for Central Africa. You, we have also as a member uh, the Belgian diplomat Josef Smets, and also of, of, 
important, as I will explain in a minute. Uh, Xavier Lufin, a specialist in Arabic and sociolinguistics in relation to the Near East, Central and East Africa, and professor at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, also, historian Guy van Temse, emeritus professor from the Vrije Universiteit Brussel, and I as a historian of science in colonial contexts. Very soon, in 2020, a new volume in the Belgian series, prepared by our colleague uh, Xavier Luffin, was published under the title Un autre regard sur l'histoire congolaise, les documents arabes et Swahili dans les archives belges. This book contains a series of important Arabic and Swahili documents from the Congo, from Uwele to Kasongo, produced at a crucial moment in the history of the Congo Free State. They allow historians working on Central Africa to refine their reading of the region's social, economic, political, and cultural history. The select documents deal with, among other things, the social hierarchy in Eastern Congo between Arabs, African Muslims, and African non-Muslims, the trade in enslaved people, the trade in food crops and ivory, etc. Of particular political importance is the correspondence between Leopold II and Tipo Tip. Colleague Luffin explored a whole series of archives, the most important of which are the archives of the Royal Museum for Central Africa, the African archives, which are the archives of the former Belgian Ministry of the Colonies, the archives of the Royal Palace, and the, the documentation center of the Musée Royal de l'Armée in Brussels. I am particularly pleased to announce that Xavier Luffin is currently working on a second volume for the Belgian series. This book will be devoted to sources in different languages related to Abdul Rahman bin Abdullah al-Baghdadi's journey, uh, an imam from Ottoman origin, to 19th century Brazil. It will highlight the entanglement of Arabic and Ottoman perspectives on sources regarding the history of the African diaspora and aims to provide new insight into the history of enslaved Muslim Africans in the Americas, both in terms of religious life, social organization, interaction with local communities and populations. In this respect, this work ties in with research topics related to Africa's place in global history. In its new composition, the Belgian committee is looking for new projects. One of the more advanced projects is a social history of the workers of the colonial company Union Minière du Okatanga, based on life stories from the period 1910-1960, uh, produced by Donatien Dibwe Dia Mwembu, a corresponding member of our academy who is professor at the University of Lubumbashi. These life stories, based mainly on oral testimonies, of which only a few extracts have so far been published, form a rich corpus that will enable a much more diversified and detailed examination of working conditions in the colonial economy. Other projects are still in a prospective phase, ranging from sources about missionaries in Kasai in the time of the Mulelist Rebellion, 1964-1965, to unpublished sources in Lingala and little-known sources in the archives left behind by Jan van Sina. The, source, uh, the Belgian committee members notice a growing interest among students and young researchers for sources related to African perspectives on the history of Sub-Saharan Africa. A growing amount of research papers and PhD studies involve these sources. This trend may lead to the enrichment of the Fontes series in the near future. The Belgian Committee also sees new challenges in the wake of the Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry that recently examined Belgium's colonial past. Its recommendations emphasize both the closer involvement of African scholars in historical research, but also making the archives in Belgium more accessible, as numerous collections have not yet been inventorized. It is evident that many interesting documents produced by African actors and written in African languages can still be found in both the Belgian State Archives and the archives of the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Their further opening up offers new opportunities for the Fontes series. Although the Belgian part in Fontes Historia Africana is rather modest in size compared to other national initiatives which have existed for much 
longer, the Belgian Committee is determined to enrich its series by publishing new critical editions and translations of written sources and oral presentations that meet the high standards of excellence that are applied by all partners of this undertaking. For this, the committee, committee will rely on the vast expertise of the Belgian and foreign members of the Academy in African matters. They are the ones who will allow our series to live and grow. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor van der Smissen, for your uh, challenging presentation of the Belgium Committee. I think this presentation was interesting mainly from the point of view that we discussed uh, more yesterday, that also colonial sources for African history matters. Fontes Historia Africana is a project that was from its beginning mainly concentrated on the manuscripts, but this research has its own limits as well. And uh, now we know that the colonial sources are equally important for the reconstruction of the African history as the African manuscripts produ produced here on the African soil. Now we know that we have to combine our knowledge from both perspectives. So thank you very much. And thank you, thank you that you mentioned this publication of the Arabic sources for Congo history. I think it can be very interesting for the two ladies uh, that had uh, this uh, very important presentation before us. Uh, personally, I look forward to, to, to the volume about uh, lost archives of Jan Van Sana. Uh, it's, I, I'm really surprised that something like this is happening and I look forward to it. As uh, we spoke yesterday, Jan Van Sana was uh, pioneer of the codification of oral history as a methodology of history. So thank you very much. And uh, when this publication uh, will be published, uh, let me know. It will take a long time because there are a lot of issues, complicated issues. Uh, also, I didn't speak about this, of course, because, uh, but we have, for example, also um, the problem of time mm -hmm. and uh, that that professional historians can dedicate to the long work, and it is illustrated yesterday also, the long work that takes mm -hmm. an edition of texts. Um, it is not really popular. Everybody finds it, finds it very important, but to finance it uh, and mm -hmm. to invest time as we are all working at universities and uh, have a lot of obligations in teaching and doing research and publishing articles, books, etc. Um, editing texts is something that that needs concentration and a long time vision. So um, the uh, the project around Yavancina is as we said, in a kind of uh, prospective phase, we look for partners, we look for people who want to invest time for it. Uh, and we need also to have the context because uh, in this particular case, there's the context of American Belgian uh, uh, cooperation, uh, which is also of importance with the teams um, at uh, the University of Wisconsin, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh before I give a word to our colleague, uh, Professor Nafefe, I just want to uh, address uh, two researchers at uh, Webex, uh, Professor Joanna Barr from Poland and uh, Dave Fatiwain. Excuse us for a little delay, but we are still counting with you. Uh, uh, we had a very important discussion uh, before this panel, and we lost a bit of time, so please excuse us and uh, stay connected, okay? And now, uh, let me welcome you, our uh, colleague, uh, Joel Nafefe. Uh, Joel Nafefe is a lecturer in, in uh, Bristol University, and he is representing uh, a British Academy which is a very important academy uh, for the project Fontes Historia Africane. He was born in uh, Guinea-Bissau, so it is a 
West uh, African, uh, the first West African we have here, not online, but uh, in person. So I am very pleased. And uh, yes, you have a word. Thank you very much, Silvas, for the uh, warm introduction. Um, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to come to this conference. Can you can you hear me? It's, yeah, it, it is pretty, I can't speak French. I understand French a little bit, but I can't use it here for doing this presentation. I hope you're going to bear with me for the next, uh, for the next 20 minutes. If anything, you can raise your hand if you don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, talking about African sources, uh, Sylvester just said, um, I am part of the British Academy in Britain, where we've been meeting, looking at documents that are being published or going to be published uh, by colleagues who are working on African history, culture and politics or economics, other issues that come with it. I think my presentation fit in into that category, people who are working on African bodies, African characters, African uh, players in the history of the Atlantic slave trade. I have just published a book. I will pass it along for you to see. It's published by Cambridge University Press. It came out last August, so it still is pretty new, hot, maybe I would say. Um, I will pass it along so that you can have a look at it. And it is precisely the sources that I have encountered through the archives in the Americas and in Europe that I'm going to be talking to you about. But these sources and history is based on a person or a figure in the history of Angola. His grandfather was a, um, a puppet king. In other words, a king anointed or a king appointed or elected by the Portuguese in 1626. Uh, this was a time when Queen Zinga of Matamba was also a queen of Angola Matamba. We can put it that way. That way. But Philip de Souza was half brother of Queen Zinga, and that make it even much more complicated in this regard. So the story goes like this, that when he died, his children came into power. They were part of the Jesuit training college in Luanda. Uh, they came into power, but they rejected the Portuguese alliance and a war was fought in 1671 in what is today called Pungandongo in Angola. After that war was fought, the king then, who was uh, Mendonca's, that I'm going to talk about very briefly, Mendonca's uncle was killed and his queen was killed. His young son was sent to Portugal as prisoner of war. He was seven years old. But then the rest of the other family were then sent to Brazil as prisoners of war in 1671. They stayed in Brazil for 18 months in Salvador, but then they realized being in Salvador, there were a lot of enslaved Africans. They could run away and join the enslaved community in Pernambuco called the Quilombo de Palmares, which was a political organization that was attempting to defend the interest of the African in the Atlantic. So the story of this prince who was sent to uh, Brazil that I'm tracing his sources. His sources become fundamental in terms of finding out what is African history and what is African culture that has been written from the European perspective. Is, 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 is everybody still with me? Yeah, more or less. So Mendoza end up in the Vatican in 1684 after his stay in Portugal, he produced this, um, what you may call discourses 
on the political law at that time. Mendoza argues that slavery, as we know it, the Atlantic slavery was against uh, four principles of laws. Slavery was against natural law. Slavery was against human law. Slavery was against divine law. Slavery was against civil law. So four principle of laws that he stated at that time. So all of that become part of the story. And what you see here uh, in, on the screen is a caption of um, um, a letter. We will see that letter in a minute that he took from Lisbon. This letter was given to him from the Vatican ambassador in Lisbon. Uh, that is the letter he took to the Vatican. Um, and the letter has in it these inscriptions, which is a coat of arm, uh, which says the morir es los más cierto, in Spanish language, which means death is more certain. What that means to us was, what Mendoza was stating very clearly, was the African were dying in numbers. And that is the letter. You can see there in the middle what that is and so on. Um, the inscription in terms of the writing of that capture phrase which says morir es los más cierto is actually a Latin dictum. It is a Latin dictum which says mors certa es at eos orta incerta es. Death is certain but is ours is uncertain. So all of this become the issue that was part of what Mendoza was presenting in the Vatican. And that presentation, uh, as I was saying to you, uh, tell us a little bit more of who the African were in their way of living their culture, and, but not only the way of living their culture, what kind of sources have been produced that represented their, their fight against slavery. Uh, here you have a family tree of Mendoza uh, going back to the kings of Congo uh, and so on. So the bigger picture of what was going at that time in Angola and Congo, in particular Angola, was the issues of slavery. So that is what the book is about. Um, the book is about slavery, and not only about slavery, but it is about the abolition of the slave trade. So very quickly here, we see this diagram attempting to represent what happened if we were to understand the dynamic of colonial power from the Portuguese understanding. We have to understand it within three different powers that operated at that time. You have the Crown, you have the Overseas Council, and then you have the Municipal Council. Municipal Council were the cities in those uh, areas of Brazil, Africa, and so on. I'm not going to read all of that because this is not part of what I wanted to talk about. What I wanted to talk to you about is about the kind of um, document that have been produced. When Fernando Souza, who was the governor, of Angola from 1623, from 1623 to 1630s, uh, for four years, five years in, 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 in Angola, he produced document. But those documents were reflecting some of the concepts which were Africans. We have the word here in Combros, and we also have the word baculamento. All of those were African words coming from Kimbundu language. They were tax systems word concepts that Fernando Souza has made become part of the structure of the Portuguese colonial system. But the way those words come into the vocabulary of the Portuguese system have very much been distorted. They're no longer having the same meaning in the sense that we understand them. In Combros, in the Kimbundu language, meant a word that you pay tax to your superior. But the tax is paid in the form of produce. Things like rice, maize, chicken, and other things. 
when that word was substituted with the Portuguese taxation system, all the produce disappeared. We now have the new term by the Portuguese, which is also Kimbundu terms, called Baclamento. By this time, Fernando Souza has argued that for the Angolan sobers who were dominated, controlled by the Portuguese in their tax system, they would have to pay 100 enslaved persons per year, rather than paying tax system which was based on produce. I see there here, the concept taken, but completely overturned and it becomes something else and so on. So all of those documents are scattered in the archives. They're scattered in the archives in Angola. They're scattered in the archives in Brazil. They're scattered in archives in Portugal. They are scattered in archives in Spain. They are scattered in archives in the Vatican in Italy. So in other words, the story of what Mendoza has done thrown to us in terms of how we chase document, how we chase sources that represented what African life was at that time. So let me show you some of the other thing that uh, I wanted to show you. That was Pungandongo. I wanted now go very quickly to show you what is the sources that have come here. The journey, as I was saying to you there, it began from Angola. This prince who couldn't stay in Angola because the Portuguese suspected them, they were sent to Brazil. From Angola to Brazil by El Salvador, and from Salvador, then the Portuguese feared they could run away. They were sent to Rio, and from Rio, they're then sent to Portugal to study, and then from Portugal, Mendoza then traveled from Portugal to Madrid, and from Madrid, to the Vatican in Rome. So these journeys have produced huge amount of documents. They include letters, they include court case, because what Mendoza presented in the Vatican was a, was a court case, as I was saying to you. Not only they, they produce court case document, they also produce minutes that were being discussed in relation to what was happening to the enslaved African and so on. So the, the problem that we have, a way of understanding, as Silvestri was saying earlier, to understand the history of the African, we also have to take into account the sources that come from the European. We have sources that were written at this time by the African from Brazil, what we are sent to the Vatican called Memorial, but those documents, we have not been able to find them. I went to Salvador myself, trying to look through them, through the churches at that time, because the sources were sent through the organization of the black Christian within the Bayern churches. They carried this document called the Memorial, which was document, official document to help the court case in the Vatican. I was in the Vatican last year. We went to the library. The library did not find, couldn't find it. We looked around, we couldn't. We asked, they checked, they couldn't find. So the place now we're hoping that those documents might be available is the propaganda feed archives or the, the Vatican archive itself. Maybe we could, because what was happening at this time, documents that were produced like this, you would have two copies. One copy will be sent to the governor, or in this case to the Vatican. Another copy will be kept in the place where the document was produced. This is why I thought I, I was able to find one, another copy in Brazil, but it became very difficult because of the organization of the churches you go in there, somebody's on holiday or other things that um, you may not encounter. But also there is an archive in Salvador. Um, sorry. Um, I asked whether I could go to this archive, which is actually an archive of that belonged to black Christian from the 17th century up to now. They have their own archives. 
they have their own documentation, but I wasn't able to get into it. It's just simply because the organization, the way it is. Um, I was told, okay, you can come, I sent a letter, you can come and see the archives. When I got there, it became very difficult. No, you can't see the document because the document needs to be digitalized and so on and so forth. So when, as a researcher, you become impatient in terms of time you don't have because you work for the universities and so on and so forth. But to call attention to, to, to the problem that we have about this, also I just want to talk about three things here. But before I do that, for the book I have produced, to be able to write this book, I used seven different languages to chasing sources. And that is Kimbundo language, the Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, Latin, a bit of French, and English. So all of those constitute sources that are necessary for us to understand in our modern time, what might have been the past of African and so on. But where are these sources? In my own understanding from what I have done, because I've just simply followed Mendonca's path, they are in Brazil, they are in Angola, they are in Spain, they are in, in Rome, and many other places we could find them. But to understand this document, we need to understand them within the context that they have been produced. Not only the context of the European, but also the context of the African, because this particular story has been written because of the contact with African. So we can't look at the document only from the point of view of the European understanding. We have to understand them from the point of view of the African. What does that throw to us? It throws to us which I think a lot of uh, colleagues have just said here this morning, the idea that we need to understand the African languages themselves. Where these stories have been produced within that context, what is the politics of, um, of that region and so on. How many minutes do I still have? Approximately 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, that's very good. Um, Five, 10 minutes. So what I would like to just to throw in some of the, the context that I'm talking about within the sources that have risen from what we have found within the European writing about the African, it is very important. I think other people have done this, but if you look at say, for example, the term terminology that is called slave, slave, what is slave? in the African understanding. This in itself presented a problem because the people who were writing at this time were translating concepts that very often they don't understand. We have at this time a, a, a Portuguese soldier in Angola in the 17th century, Antonio de Cardonega, he was writing about wars in Angola but he used the word slave. But then when you look, start reading him, you realize that he was struggling with the concept itself. Slave, he uses three different words to describe the same terminology. And that is slave, he used the term slave. Slave, he used the term servant. Slave, he used the term maid. So then you wonder, did he understand the context he was dealing with, or was he struggling to translate a concept which required an understanding elsewhere? This, I think, presented a problem when we have to read sources. What do we do with the African language? How do we understand them? And not only that, the biggest danger here is we beginning to read these sources from one context and assume that we get the understanding of what was going on in that particular moment in time, uh, in the period from which these uh, uh, things were being sort of uh, written. We also have another word that comes through the document in the Kimbundu language, it is Mobika. Mobika is translated as a servant. But the way it's been translated through the document, it became a slave person. Mobika becoming slave rather than using it perhaps as a maid. 
what we understand from the original language of Kumbundu Angolan people, Mobika does not mean enslave. It is a polite way of you saying at your service. At your service, in other words, I'm here to do whatever you may want me to do and so on. So all of this represented a kind of reading that we have to do in terms of what document, how we encounter them, to what do we do with them? How do we chase these documents through the archives as they come along? Who have produced them? What do they represent to us in terms of our understanding? I think my five minutes have finished, so I'm going to leave it here. I hope we have some discussion about it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fantastic and challenging presentations. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, much time for the full, uh, full account of information that you can provide us. There is your book. Uh, we certainly can find everything in there, and I hope there will be a discussion. Uh, I'm, thank you for addressing a topic that wasn't here so far at this conference, and it was the Atlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm but also the question of African diaspora. African diaspora is also in the center of African research, and I think even uh, African Union, African Union considers African diaspora as its fifth region, not only North, South, West, East, but also African diaspora. So thank you very much, and congratulations to, for your book. Now I would like to uh, invite Professor Joanna Barr, Professor Joanna Barr, can you hear me? Excuse me, Professor Joanna Barr. We can't hear. Maybe there is a problem with your microphone. Microphone. Can you, can you please set up your microphone from the beginning? Er was uh, connected. Perhaps uh, maybe we can try and Jaya Fati Wayne. Are you? Can you hear me? Jay Fati Wayne. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, je sais pas si uh, Professeur Bar uh, va revenir, mais moi je pourrais commencer puisque j'avais prévu autre chose après là. Donc. Uh, je... Okay. Je, je, on va vous donner la parole Merci en attendant que, que, que Madame Professeur Barr va se connecter. Okay. Alors, permettez-moi de présenter euh, la chercheuse euh, associée au laboratoire d'études et de recherche appliquée à l'Afrique de l'Université de Chicoutimi à Québec, euh, Day Fati Wayne. C'est ça? Euh, C'est Wayne, ça se prononce Wayne. One. Excuse, excuse bon, me. C'est correct. Je, je suis habitué, mais euh, c'est okay, pas plus donc, grave que ça. Bon, alors bonjour. Elle, va nous, oui? elle va nous présenter sa, son introduction euh, construction identitaire, réappropriation symbolique, la contribution de Cerno Souleyman Bal à l'histoire politique compte. Alors, bonjour. Voilà, la parole est votre. Merci beaucoup de me donner la parole. Bonjour tout le monde. Et euh, donc, euh, c'est pour moi un honneur de participer à, 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 à ces journées d'échange scientifiques. Et euh, donc, euh, voilà, donc pour des raisons indépendantes de ma volonté, je n'ai pas pu être en présentiel, mais ça, je... euh, ça ne sera que partie remise. Donc, sans plus tarder, effectivement, je vais euh, vous présenter, euh, euh, faire un exposé sur euh, la contribution de Tcherno Suleimani Bal euh, sur, euh, dans l'histoire politique. Et euh, voilà, je ne sais pas si vous serez capable de voir mon, mes slides, que je peux, euh, sinon je pourrais 
C'est possible pour vous de voir, visualiser mes slides, le oui, partage? Oui, 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 on peut, si okay, vous partagez. Là, je lance le partage. N'hésitez pas. Alors, c'est fait, je l'ai lancé. Vous me dites si c'est correct? On vous entend, mais on ne voit pas votre présentation. Alors, le partage est lancé. Oh, ça commence. OK. Le processus suit son cours. Parfait. Voilà, on est là. C'est bon? OK, parfait. Essayez Et donc, de make full screen, maybe. Why? Full, full screen. Can you... OK. OK, it's correct? Vous pouvez commencer. Parfait. Voilà, donc, euh, euh, voilà, moi, ma présentation, c'est euh, euh, sur un personnage, une personnalité politique euh, que j'ai euh, découvert euh, dans, dans mes recherches. Et donc, euh, à, à, juste pour préciser que je ne suis pas historienne, hein, je ne suis pas historienne, je suis euh, sociologue de formation, je suis diplômée de l'Université Laval à Québec. Et donc, euh, c'est euh, dans le cadre d'une recherche, d'une commande de recherche, justement, sur les Almami du Fouta que je suis to tombée sur cette euh, sur, sur, sur Tierno, sur les Manibal, et donc j'ai tout abandonné, je me suis vraiment concentrée sur cette personnalité politique-là. Et euh, c'est pour cette raison-là que, euh, voilà, maintenant mes intérêts de recherche, euh, c'est vraiment de faire de sorte que, euh, cette, euh, de comprendre surtout, en mobilisant bien sûr euh, le, le corpus théorique de ma discipline, à savoir la sociologie, et comprendre, euh, pourquoi Tierno Suleiman Ibal, euh, son œuvre, euh, sa, sa contribution politique euh, fait euh, l'objet donc de cette sorte d'invisibilité. Et donc, euh, voilà, euh, mon plan de présentation euh, est le suivant. Dans un premier temps, je vais tenter euh, de faire, justement, c'est ça que j'ai tenté de faire, euh, euh, des liens peut-être pas toujours évidents, mais en tout cas, j'ai voulu lier le fait que l'œuvre de Suleiman Bal soit euh, rendue invisible ou le, et également ce, euh, un enjeu sociétal, surtout en Amérique du Nord, aux États-Unis et au Canada notamment, ailleurs aussi, hein, euh, en ce qui a trait à ce qu'on appelle un peu la problématique de, euh, du racisme systémique. Donc, euh, et en voulant faire ces liens-là, ben, j'ai pris un mouvement que tout le monde connaît, c'est-à-dire celui euh, du Black Lives Matter, un mouvement qui est né aux États-Unis, et puis on y reviendra. Je ne sais pas si les liens sont, euh, sont, sont pertinents, mais en tout cas, j'ai voulu le faire pour euh, montrer des marqueurs euh, similaires entre les, 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 ces, 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 ces deux, euh, ces, ces deux euh, faits. Et dans un deuxième temps, je parlerai, euh, puisque j'essaie de comprendre un peu qu ce qui explique ce déni-là, cette invisibilité, je vais mettre en avant euh, les mécanismes à l'œuvre dans le déni de soi, en partant bien sûr du corpus euh, de, des théories sociologiques. Et bien sûr, euh, je parlerai de Suleiman Bal, qui il est, le savant, qu'est-ce qu'il a fait dans le, euh, dans le champ politique. Et surtout, et ce qui est aussi important, pourquoi cette personnalité politique-là est importante aujourd'hui, c'est parce que tout simplement, euh, les, euh, ces, euh, ces recommandations euh, de politiques, de gouvernance en tout cas politique, ce sont des recommandations qui, à mon sens, sont euh, d'une actualité assez criarde. Et donc, ceci euh, nous, euh, nous ramène toujours à notre interrogation, pourquoi est-ce que euh, cette personnalité-là, ces contributions-là, ne sont pas des sources d'inspiration, en tout cas, pour nos États en, en, en construction. Et donc, en, en, en finale, pour le point 6, je parlerai donc que, bien sûr, tout ce qu'il a apporté en termes donc, de théorie et de pratique politique constitue, bien sûr, une référence en sciences politiques, même si on ne on, on le, on, 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 on le voit pas. Alors, deux mouvements, deux marques similaires. Je le disais à l'entame de mon propos, le mouvement Black Lives Matter, que tout le monde connaît, il a émergé suite à, au meurtre d'un noir américain par un policier blanc et il va être à l'origine donc d'un vaste mouvement de protestation euh, donc, euh, des, euh, des noirs américains euh, euh, luttant ou alors protestant contre l'invisibilité systémique dont ils euh, qui, qui vivent au quotidien. 
Alors, le euh, Black Lives Matter, il s'insurge donc contre ce système-là qui couvre à dessein euh, l'identité euh, noire américaine. Alors, le mouvement, euh, l'autre mouvement de l'autre côté de l'Atlantique, c'est celui euh, dont Tierno Suleiman Ibal a été le leader. Il s'agit de la révolution Torodo. Alors, cette révolution-là, il s'agit d'un mouvement politique religieux du 18e siècle et euh, qui a été porté par des leaders locaux, des étudiants, en fait, des étudiants euh, euh, de, qui sont allés dans les universités euh, sénégalaises, notamment dans la sous-région, s'instruire, notamment dans l'université de Pire. Et c'est euh, à partir de là qu'ils se sont vraiment euh, euh, rendus compte de la de, de la de la déchéance morale de leur société d'origine, à savoir Futatoro, qui à l'époque était euh, dirigée par la dynastie des Denyanke. Et, euh, et c'est Suleiman Bal va être vraiment à la tête de ce mouvement là euh, de contestation et au retour de retour donc de leur voyage euh, de leur voyage, euh, de, de leur formation, on va dire, universitaire, ils vont euh, tout simplement mettre en œuvre leur projet de révolutionner cette société-là euh, du Fouta. Et donc, en mettant en œuvre un modèle de gouvernance éthique et démocratique, euh, bien que basé sur les lois islamiques, à savoir la charia. On va y revenir. Et... Euh, ces deux mouvements, on sait bien que c est, c est, les deux dimensions spatio-temporelles sont vraiment très éloignées, hein? mais euh, j'ai cherché à, certain, à trouver un certain nombre de marqueurs, en tout cas des points de similitude, et euh, c'est ce qui m'a autorisé à dire, par exemple, que euh, d'une part, on voit que le mouvement Black Lives Matter donc, dérive d'une contestation euh, d'un ordre hein, qui invisibilise une communauté, et euh, le D'autre part aussi, pour ce qui concerne la révolution Torodo, alors, bien qu'elle soit l'instigatrice d'une constitution qui est basée sur des principes éthiques, comme on, peut, on a pu le dire tout à l'heure, et démocratique, alors, euh, ce qu'il y a de, 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 part, enfin, de similaire avec euh, ce, les liens de similarité qu'on peut trouver ici, c'est que oui, actuellement, à l'heure où je vous parle, euh, ce, euh, ce projet politique-là n'est pas connu donc n'est pas ancré dans l'imaginaire collectif, n'est pas ancré dans les consciences collectives. Alors oui, vous allez me dire, mais on n'est pas toujours, on n'est pas dans les mêmes contextes temporels, c'est bien vrai, euh, on est dans un contexte, mais ici, ce qu'il y a, c'est que on est, c'est est vraiment un, un, une problématique ou alors euh, intramuros, mais euh, allié également avec l'histoire même, de, 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 de cette partie de l'Afrique, l'Afrique au sud du Sahara, qui a connu donc un passé colonial et tout. Et donc, c'est là où vraiment euh, se trouve la pertinence même de l'interrogation à se dire, maintenant qu'on ne peut plus vraiment invoquer ou évoquer ce passé colonial-là, qu'est-ce qu qui explique ce, ce déni? Qu'est-ce qui explique cette invisibilité-là? On ne peut plus toujours, on ne, on ne va pas porter la responsabilité de cette invisibilité aux, colo aux colons qui ne sont plus là, mais on constate bien évidemment que cette invisibilité-là, elle est réelle. Et donc, voilà euh, ce point central de, de similitude euh, avec euh, vraiment des aspects peut-être, euh, des, de, de, des grilles de lecture différentes, mais euh, non, non moins pertinentes. Alors, pour moi, euh, ce, qui a, ce qui est important ici de savoir, quand j'ai essayé de comprendre, et bien sûr en mobilisant un peu euh, ce que je connais le plus, c'est-à-dire le corpus euh, théorique euh, en, en sociologie, alors là, j'ai mobilisé par exemple un concept qui est quand même important en sociologie, celui de la violence symbolique. Alors, c'est quoi la violence symbolique? La violence symbolique, c'est un concept qui a été rendu euh, célèbre par le sociologue français Bourdieu. Et donc, c'est ce processus-là par lequel le dominé hein, va participer à sa domination. Donc, elle, elle opère comment? Elle, elle opère en s'attaquant au système de pensée des dominés qui vont assimiler et intégrer les solutions du dominateur. Alors, euh, Bourdieu va considérer, par exemple, donner l'exemple de l'école qui, pour lui, est un des instruments majeurs de la violence symbolique puisque euh, cette action pédagogique-là d'apprentissage, d'intégration, d'assimilation va euh, s'opérer et va se, euh, se, se transformer en une sorte d'imposition d'un pouvoir arbitraire, d'un pouvoir culturel. Et donc, oui, dans le cas de l'invisibilité de dont l'œuvre 
et euh, de Tierno Suleimani Bal fait l'objet au sein même donc, de cette sous-région-là, on peut bien euh, mobiliser ce concept-là pour l'expliquer. Donc, voilà. Euh, on, fait, on va aller faire référence, on va aller mobiliser les théories euh, de Montesquieu, on va mobiliser euh, les, les, les théories quand, concernant la, la séparation des pouvoirs, euh, on va mobiliser les théories euh, de Machiavel pour ce qui concerne un type de un modèle de gouvernance, mais jamais on ne parlera de l'œuvre de Suleiman Bal qui pourtant... Euh, et je, je rajoute, je vais de, de toute façon, je, 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 je vais le dire après, ce que Suleiman Bal avec ses compagnons, avec ses, ses amis, euh, cette révolution-là, date de 1776. 1776, vous voyez bien que c'est antérieur même à la révolution euh, française, qui elle est connue par, par tout le monde et qui, 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 qui est une référence, qui fait date en tout cas dans l'histoire mondiale et euh, nous, en ce qui nous concerne, L'acte la, posé par ces révolutionnaires-là n'est pas un acte fondateur de quoi que ce soit. Alors, ça, c'est euh, le premier concept mobilisé. Le deuxième concept, c'est celui de l'aliénation culturelle. Alors, l'aliénation culturelle, hein, c'est un concept qui est à la fois philosophique et, et sociologique et peut également, à, à notre sens, être mobilisé comme étant une clé de lecture intéressante du caractère invisible de, et politique de Tierno Suleimani Bal. Euh, et, et semble relever, donc je n'entrerai pas dans les détails hein, de ce concept-là qui est quand même assez large, euh, et euh, en, ce, ce qui nous intéresse ici, c'est que s'il vient, on va l'ajouter à la violence symbolique pour mieux expliquer cette invisibilité-là, et ça a l'air euh, que l'aliénation la, culturelle procède en tout cas de la même façon, relève du même pro, pro, processus et va poursuivre également... Les, les mêmes finalités. Je, je, je m'excuse, désolé. Désolé pour cette petite... Alors, je, je poursuis. Euh... Alors, euh, est-ce est est que vous me suivez toujours? Parce que là, moi, j'ai été un peu perturbée. Oui, oui, ça. oui, on vous entend. Euh... Parfait. On vous entend bien et je voudrais vous informer que vous avez à peu près 10 minutes, ok Ok, parfait. Votre je, serai présentation. Dans le temps. je serai dans le temps. Alors, qui est Suleymane Ibal maintenant Suleymane Ibal est à la fois un homme de science, un révolutionnaire et un visionnaire. Alors, Suleymane Ibal, on le connaît comme étant étudiant, hein? il est euh, en compagnie de ses alliés. Donc, euh, euh, composé d'éminents intellectuels qui sont rompus aux arcanes de l'islam, il va lancer, il va se lancer vraiment à l'assaut du Fouta Toro. Alors, euh, et pour vraiment poursuivre son projet de changer la société Foutanke, qui, je l'ai dit, euh, était dirigée par la dynastie euh, des Denyanke. Alors, euh, Suleymane Bal va se démarquer également, euh, après cette révolution Toro de là, par une, 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 une série de, de recommandations et de décisions qui sont quand même peu communes. Alors, à, alors que la, 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 euh, alors que la, la, la après que la révolution donc, a, 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 a été euh, donc, euh, réalisée, on s'attendait à ce que Suleymane Bal en soi soit le leader incontesté, puisque c'est lui qui a été le leader qui a, été, qui a porté le mouvement. Mais Suleymane Bal a plutôt euh, émis une, un certain nombre de, de recommandations et en se désistant, en disant euh, « Moi, mon objectif, c'était de mettre en place, euh, de, de, de réaliser ce, ce, cette révolution-là, mais euh, voilà, il est atteint. » Je m'arrête là. Maintenant, pour ce qui concerne celui qui va opérationnaliser, qui va rendre, pratiquer les, 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 les concepts ou les recommandations, il va falloir que vous choisissez euh, entre, euh, le, euh, parmi nous, hein, ou, ou même au-delà, en tout cas, la personne qui euh, répondrait du point de vue éthique, du point de vue moral, du point de vue également des, des connaissances, hein, parce que c'était les trois principaux critères pour élire l'Almami. Ben, il faut que vous choisissez la bonne personne et il se trouve que la, personne, la bonne personne, ce n'est pas moi. Et donc ça, il faut le dire, c'est quand même une grande décision qui mérite d'être connue, qui mérite d'être euh, popularisée, hein, d'être vulgarisée, parce que ce n'est pas, pas toujours qu'on qu voit ces, ces, ces genres de, de décisions-là de la part d'un leader qui a été quand même à l'origine d'un changement euh, radical de perspective et de gouvernance d'une société. 
Alors, euh, en plus de ça, ce qu'il faut savoir aussi euh, de, euh, des propositions de Suleymane Ibal, donc, euh, il va, par exemple, euh, euh, faire une proposition qui aussi, à mon avis, est assez, assez importante. Euh, dans le choix euh, de, des leaders, il a émis un certain nombre de recommandations en alertant, par exemple, sur le risque d'accaparement si toutefois, euh, il y aurait un, euh, des, des groupes hein, ou des groupuscules, disons, qui vont tenter de, euh, de se maintenir au pouvoir, de faire vraiment très attention. Euh, par exemple, si un leader est choisi et qu'au bout d'un certain temps, on voit des euh, changements euh, du point de vue euh, voilà, matériel, on, on, des, des changements qui n'ont pas eu, et ça, on, on, on pense notamment à, à l'enrichissement illicite dans nos sociétés qui constitue des, 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 des problématiques de gouvernance. Si toutefois, vous voyez que le leader qui a été choisi commence à changer, ou à, pour, alors que les raisons, ne, on ne lit pas nécessairement, on ne comprend pas les raisons de ce changement là, destituez-le. Destituez-le parce que là, ça donne un indice qu'il y a une problématique de gouvernance à quelque part. Donc, euh, euh, nous, en ce qui nous concerne, moi en tout cas, ce qui m'intéresse ici, c'est que ce, ces propositions constituent un fonds symbolique endogène sur lequel il est possible d'envisager tout un corpus de, de, de bonne gouvernance qui permettrait donc, dans le contexte où nous nous trouvons dans nos pays, une appropriation plus efficace de, de nos valeurs. Alors, autre chose aussi, je ne sais pas combien euh, de temps il me reste pour rester vraiment dans le temps. Euh, à peu près quatre minutes. OK. Euh, alors, aussi, en ce qui concerne le projet de société, la révolution Torodo, euh, dans ses principes constitutionnels, on est au 18e siècle, hein, il prévoyait une prise en charge des personnes vulnérables, donc euh, notamment les orphelins, les enfants, les personnes âgées et tout. Ah, donc, ces dispositions constitutionnelles-là, au 18e siècle, on voit bien que ça rejoigne, euh, rejoigne les objectifs d'un État social inclusif, d'un État même providence. Donc, on voit ici vraiment une, une, un, un personnage qui, qui est, qui est une, un visionnaire, qui est désireux de, de ne laisser personne euh, au, au, à côté. On reconnaît bien ici, donc, les principes euh, de base d'un système de solidarité, notamment organique, euh, euh, caractéristique centrale des sociétés modernes dites avancées. Et donc, là, j'en viens à ma conclusion euh, pour dire euh, que vraiment, euh, la, la, cette personnalité politique-là, euh, de, de notre histoire euh, dans le, au XVIIIe siècle, à, euh, il est, ce serait important, donc euh, on a tout intérêt à mieux connaître ses œuvres. Je sais qu'il y a beaucoup d'historiens, en tout cas, qui travaillent sur euh, l'œuvre euh, et les recommandations de Suleymane Ibal, mais c'est important aussi que, c est, c est, que la vulgarisation se fasse au-delà, euh, au-delà, oui, mais encore plus chez nous. Euh, euh, dans nos pays euh, qui font face à des problématiques de, de gouvernance et qui vont aller euh, chercher euh, ailleurs des, euh, des préceptes, des préceptes qui parfois ne, 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 ne marchent pas toujours, hein, parce que tout simplement venant d'ailleurs, alors qu'il euh, y a eu justement ces, euh, ces, ces, ces débuts, euh, en tout cas ce projet-là au XVIIIe siècle euh, d'un individu euh, hors du commun qui a quand même jeté les bases d'un État inclusif et euh, bien gouverné. Alors, je m'arrête là. J'espère que, bon, en attendant que euh, la période de, des questions puisse donner lieu peut-être à d'autres échanges qui me permettront vraiment d'approfondir un peu plus ma, ma réflexion et de bonifier également euh, ma présentation. Je vous remercie pour euh, votre attention et je vous rends la parole. Je vous remercie beaucoup, Madame Wan, pour votre présentation et pour nous présenter ce personnage de M. Suleiman Bar. Voilà. Pour nous présenter ses visions. Et ce que j'aime toujours dans ces concepts ou dans ce type de présentation, c'est que les chercheurs essayent de trouver un lien entre le passé et le présent. Ça, c'est très, très valable. C'est ça ce que j'ai beaucoup apprécié dans votre présentation et merci beaucoup. 
Euh, et finalement, on va essayer de euh, se connecter avec notre dernier participant, our last participant, professeur Joanna Barr. Mm -hmm. euh, maybe we can try to connect. Uh, can, you... can you hear me now? Yes, yes, finally we can hear you very well and I am very happy that we can hear you I'm very, very well. Sorry. I'm very sorry, I must change my computer. It should be okay. I'm starting from a sharing presentation. Yes, sir. If I could. While waiting, I will just uh, introduce you. Uh, Professor Joanna Barr uh, is a yes. uh, very important host to our conference. She comes from Poland and uh, it's from Polish Committee of the Fontes History Africana. We have also a Polish committee. He is from a uh, Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Krakow is in our language, Krakowie uh, en français. Uh, and uh, she will present us a project or the final stage of the long project that the Polish committee was working on and it uh, they will present us uh, the mm -hmm. the archives of Jan Czekanowski and his journal of field research in uh, Central Africa in 1907-1909 in uh, Swahili and Kenya Rwanda so I think it is something that could be also in the interest of the Belgian committee because geographically it's a very similar area the, this Polish committee was working a long time on this project and now they are preparing the books that will be published soon and uh, the rest will be told us by Professor Joanna Barr. Welcome and I give you mm -hmm. a word. Yes, uh, uh, do you see the presentation? And yes, the yes, we can see it very good. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, in the, uh, to participate in the conference. And uh, uh, Jan Czekanowski was an eminent Polish ethnographer and uh, anthropologist who was uh, a young uh, scholar a graduate of the University of Zurich, author of uh, doctoral thesis in physical anthropology, and later assistant in the Department of African Studies at the Königliches Museum für Volkerkunde in Berlin, uh, was offered the opportunity to join the expedition to the Central and Eastern Africa, organized and led by Adolf Friedrich, Duke of Mecklenburg as uh, an ethnologist, as an anthropologist of the expedition. The expedition route was to have led from uh, Mombasa via Lake Victoria to Rwanda and uh, then along the Central African rifts to reach the Ituri Arubime and Uere River Basin. However, uh, this uh, first plan was modified after a few months in Africa, due to serious health problems of two of the participants, and in January 98 from Irumo, located on the Ituri River, the expedition headed straight west to return to Europe via Congo River, and then across the Atlantic, almost a year earlier than the original plans. Only Czekanowski with the agreement of the expedition organizer and uh, partly thanks to his own founding continued it, uh, his research in accordance with uh, the original plan extending it uh, to include uh, the borderlands of uh, Safar Sudan. The Polish explorer stayed in Africa for almost 24 months from May 97 to April 98. Czekanowski uh, spoke German, French, Russian and Polish, of course, but uh, very importantly, also Swahili. He communicated easily with the colonial administrators, as well as with the missionaries from whom he received organizational assistance, information and uh, scientific materials collected especially by the white fathers, of course. With the help of an interpreter, he spoke to uh, rural, uh, local rulers, village heads, and often to ordinary people. 
Tukhanovsky included uh, the results of his research uh, work in a five volume work entitled Forschungen im Nilkongo-Zwischengebiet, intended to be an uh, integral part of the collection consisting of the work of the other members of the expedition, topographer, geologist, meteorologist, botanist, and zoologist. But the source base for all Czukanowski African publications was the journal or diary written according to the organizer's requirements on uh, an ongoing basis, day by day, throughout the expedition containing in its content both detailed information about the course of expedition and the research carried out, as well as all records of scientific nature. The text of the diary is predominantly written in German, although there were also extensive passages written in French, once and a few sentences, passages in Polish and Russian, and text and nomenclature in local languages. The Villominos collection, the big collection, was deposited uh, by the researcher's daughter and her, Anna czekanowska kuklińska in the manuscript gabinet of the University Library in Warsaw, Poland, where it's currently held as uh, a deposit. From a purely technical point of view, this collection is one of two copies, the second copy of which has been deposited in the Königliches Museum for Volker Kunde in Berlin. The diary was never, was, uh, has never been published before, neither in Poland nor in Germany. One of the main reasons why these materials were not published was the outbreak of the Second World War. The only copy of the study of the first part of the diary, which has been put into print in the spring of 1939, was destroyed in 1944, along with the entire archive in which it has been stored. The resumption of work on the manuscript of the diary was made possible thanks to the authorization given by the daughter, by Anna czekanowska kuklińska to a team appointed by the Polish Academy of Arts and Sciences, comprising Michał Czekanowski, Professor Michał Czekanowski as a chairman, Anna czekanowska kuklińska uh, me, and uh, Eugeniusz Żewuski. In 1917, this team received funding for the edition of this work from the Polish National Program for the development of the humanities. And uh, the ongoing publishing initiative has also received the patronage of the Fontes Historia Africana publishing series. In addition, in uh, 2022, the project to publish the diary was supported by a grant from the Union Academic International awarded to publish a selection of uh, 30 photographs alongside the text of the diary. The manuscript of the diary comprises two categories of notebooks. Each notebook was ultimately intended to contain 100 pages of reading. However, that is not a uniform collection. The journal diary is clearly divided into two chronological and uh, thematic groups. There are so-called large notebooks, A4 format, numbered from the first to the tenth, and they are basic records of the journal. Volumes one to seven, and the first part of volume eight preserve the chronological order of the successive stages of the expedition and the field research carried out. They have been written in the order of the numbering, 
and uh, the reminder of volume eight and volumes eight and nine uh, are uh, nine and ten are filled with tables of anthropological measurements. The so-called small notebooks format A5 are a kind of supplement to the large notebooks. They are numbered from uh, 5.8 to 5.5. The circumstance of utmost importance for understanding the state of the diary records was the big research plan, which meant that Czekanowski rarely stayed in one place for more than a few days. Regardless of the current conditions of travel, the researchers was obliged to keep daily notes, continuing day after day, regardless of tiredness or health. The circumstances in which the diary was written down had an impact uh, on the writing style, which is sometimes chaotic, contains spelling and grammatical errors, missing accents, incomprehensible abbreviations, uh, transcriptions, discrepancies, and irregular places. From a literal point of view, the manuscript is a collection of loose notes, often uh, written in the forms of uh, sentence equivalents, and big collections of dates, numbers, names, and dictionary material. Despite uh, his good knowledge of German and French, it must be remembered that neither language was uh, the researcher mother tongue, and uh, he filled uh, in the missing vocabulary by reading words in French or even Polish and Russian into the German text. This usually happened when Czekanowski was unable to find their equivalent in German, trying to find the Rhine terms in languages more familiar to him. The state of the record caused uh, the editorial team to adopt a number of difficult editorial solutions. It proved impossible to publish the material unchanged as in many passages, the text would have proved unclear to the reader. However, we took care to keep the interference to a minimum. We decided to publish the source material after supplementing it with the, an editorial apparatus in the origi original languages and uh, in Polish translation. A significant, a significant uh, difficulty in the creation of the scientific editorial apparatus of this publication was to establish uh, the correct and standardized spelling of geographical names, foreign names, and words in local languages. This difficulty was solved primarily by means of uh, verification with other publications by Czekanowski, especially the Fushungan, and uh, in the absence of this possibility, with available historical and contemporary cartographic publications. Explanations of the meaning of words in local languages, example Swahili, have or were possible been included in footnotes next to the first occurrence of the term. This edition of the diary presents material for further study. By interested researchers like Czukanowski, we have not been able to identify and translate all the languages present in the text. In the footnotes, we will try to show both some successes in translating such text and the course of efforts that ended in failure. Emphasizing the importance of the present editorial project, it is worth referring once again to the best known items, uh, Czekanowski works in Afrikanism and the volumes of Fushungen published in German. In view of of their different nature, it is worth referring uh, to the value of the diary as an invaluable source base. 
the richness of which is not compensated for the publication of the result of scientific research or the parts of the memoirs that were literally elaborated and supplemented by the author years later. In the case of Schungen, it is obvious that uh, the purpose of the publication is different. They are a final summary of the scientific results of the expeditions. The work, on the other hand, has provided important historical data those providing a broad, reliable basis for the creation and history of the dynasties and former states of the African region for modern researchers. Unlike the diary, however, it does not reflect the realities of the research conducted, the difficulties encountered by the researcher during the many months spent in the field, 24 months, sometimes under extremely difficult living conditions. In diary, Czekanowski primarily recorded his own research experiences, uh, sometimes drawing on the descriptions and notes of missionaries. The diversity of the notes is impressive. It uh, has enormous scientific significance as a comprehensive original collection of diverse and reliable information of high cognitive value for researchers of African cultures, language, and history. The descriptions of the material and spiritual culture of the people studied on the pages of the diary are the valuable source of research for anthropologists. The extensive dictionary link things for linguists and the musical notation for musicologists. The myths about the origins of the peoples and uh, dynasties under study uh, recorded by Czekanowski are not only historical sources but also excellent material for a comparative study of the role of myths in the formation of social bonds. The historical data Recorder uh, provide a valuable basis for the study of the history of the countries in this African region and the observation of social relations uh, at the turn of the century. Provide a valuable contribution to the analysis of contemporary ethnic conflicts in the region. This material, due to its richness, was only partly compiled in Fushungen. From today's perspective, we can assess that African studies allow from the perspective of his overall scientific output what not Czekanowski only field of research. It was a strong emphasis in his scientific output. The high value of Czekanowski Africanist output was recognized in uh, the studies of later researchers of these areas. His publications were cited in uh, the bibliographies of many ethnological and historical works of Africa, both immediately after the publication in the 20s and today. This is all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Barr. Thank you very much, Professor Barr, for your outstanding presentation of how the personal diaries of uh, European ethnographers could still contribute to our knowledge of uh, some regions of African history. And uh, it was also an outstanding presentation of uh, of how some ethnographers uh, recorded the oral traditions and legends in uh, African languages. This is what we were uh, talking about yesterday with, uh, in a short discussion with Mr. Tahar, that uh, some European missionaries and uh, ethnographers uh, have uh, made a very great job in recording African uh, languages uh, that were not previously recorded. Uh, I think you can uh, agree with me. So thank you very much, Joanna Barr. And uh, this was the last presentation of our conference. So now I open the last uh, discussion. If there are.
Here you are. Thank you very much indeed. I've got two questions actually. One for Mr. Van der Smissen, right? And the second one for the for Professor uh, Nafafe later. My question was about um, your intervention when you said some uh, at some point that you tapped into um, Arabic and the Swahili documents for your study. You remember you said that you were. Uh, working on a study with another, with a whole team, a group of people, and you mentioned the Arabic and Swahili documents you wanted to, to you, you tapped into. I'd like to know, where did you find them? And uh, how did you, uh, what, what, who did you use to, to, to translate these documents for you? Uh, and uh, to what extent their veracity has been uh, established? The, the, the authenticity of these documents, just to secure that later your conclusions would be as scientific as possible. I'm just curious to know about these uh, documents, uh, which, as you said, uh, reflected the Arabic and Ottoman perspective. It would be very interesting. And have you at some point thought of recurring uh, or resorting to uh, Egypt who usually, univers uh, I mean, Egyptian universities keep a lot of, uh, of uh, Ottoman documents as well, uh, which could be of interest if you, for your study. So I would be grateful if you could reply to these, to these questions for me, please. And this, the other question is um, regarding the intervention of uh, Professor uh, Nafafi. At some point, you said in your uh, presentation that uh, uh, colonial sources are very important. Is they are as important as the African sources themselves. But to what extent are these colonial sources uh, objective? Because you know, the the version of the occupier or the conqueror is very often different from that of the occupied or the. Um, so, how can you? Um, establish the objectivity uh, and how can you really uh, find a let's say a common ground between the African uh, documents which are the documents or the sources of the oppressed of or the colonized and this is uh, very important as well but at the same time how can you take into consideration the colonial sources and uh, guarantee that um, the final result would be approximative or as approximative uh, or as close or faithful to, the, to a certain truth as possible. I'd like you to elaborate on this because it's quite important and it's a very uh, present problem as well. You know, it would be, it, it's, we are still uh, wrestling with the veracity of sources, uh, whether they come from the occupier or the occupants, uh, or the uh, occupied. Sorry about that. Okay. And that will always remain a problem, even for the future. Thank you. I think you can uh, respond to uh, yes, thank, thank that. Yes. Thank you very much for your question. Um, first, it is not my research. Uh, as I explained, um, the l last volume, uh, which is on um, Arabic and Swahili texts, um, is uh, edited by Xavier Lufin, who is a professor of the University of Brussels and who is a member of our committee. He um, is an Arabist himself. He, um, his main objective, I think, was to show the uh, rich but unknown content of Belgian archives. So um, the, his own purpose, the, the only objective he had, I think, was to assemble a very representative uh, palette of sources that is hidden in the uh, archives of the Royal Palace in Brussels. Uh, as it was the seat of um, Leopold II as sovereign of the Congo Free State. 
um, and um, parts of his administration's archives are also connected to the uh, archives of the Royal Palace, but also of other institutions that were mainly involved in um, the um, Congo Free State's history. So we have, uh, for example, also the archives of the um, Museum uh, for Central Africa uh, that have an enormous amount of uh, very eclectic uh, sources and collections of which the origins are not always very, very clear, but that contain also Arabic and uh, Swahili texts. So that was the main objective to have a, a sort of overview of types of sources. And as I said, it is eclectic. It is about social history, about economic history. It is about uh, trade agreements. It is about um, also, connections uh, between uh, actors in um, the Congo Free State and the, um, the the people in power in Brussels. The, for example, the correspondence uh, with Lipotip and Leopold II, uh, which is written, um, uh, um, which is which is not in European languages but in African languages, is. Is there so that is the main uh, objective. He himself is an Arabist, and I understand that for his um, for the translation of the Swahili, Swahili text, uh, he um, worked together with members of the team in Brussels of his uh, of his university uh, to to make the translations because it's, uh, uh, all the texts are translated in French. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Napis. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. I think it's a very interesting question. Um, what I meant by um, this idea that European sources are very important, as the African sources are, is of course sources that are written by people who are not part of, say, the oppression or the suffering. Sometimes they reflect their own reality rather than the reality of the oppressed. But there are two things here fundamental, which I, I attempted to show in the book. I've got a lot of images here, but I couldn't show them because time was that short. Sometimes what you get within the colonial power structure, you get what I call the dialogue, but not so much dialogue in the sense of dialogue leading to something. It is this conflictual dialogue when the interests of the two groups come shocking, sorry, um, thus then something is revealed in the middle. What I'm trying to say to you, in Angola in particular, uh, at the time there was a conflict between the missionaries in the 17th century, 1623, and the governor. The governor was sent there, but the governor was instigating slavery. He wanted slavery, he wanted an African to be captured, he was instigating war. So as a result of that, not only that, he also wanted to imprison the wealthier merchant in the group. What happened, this merchant, one of them, was hiding with the missionary. All his wealth, they've written a very quick document, they passed it, that wealth to the missionaries. So then the missionaries were defending why that was the case. So what came out of it, we were revealed much more detail politically what the context of Portuguese interest in the region was. Through that dialogue, through that conflict, you know, the governor is saying something, the missionary is saying something. As a result of that, we have more revelation about why slavery was taking place, who was instigating what, you know, how the African were being used. Another example that came out of that too was also we have Mendonca in the Vatican in the 16th century. He presented a case, a court case, in, in which he accused Italy or Rome, um, Vatican at the time, he accused uh, Spain, Portugal for committing crime against the African. He used those four principles of laws. But those laws, the way he used them, were summary. At least for the statement, he, 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 he believed in, in that court case. 
So when you read that, you think, where could we find more information about what natural law was, what it meant, what human law was, what it meant, and what civil law meant, and what divine law meant. What then we find in the similar period, two missionaries who were asked to give evidence in, the, in this court case have written extensively about what law, natural law, human law meant. So that give us a much more better picture, what you may call the objective understanding of what those law meant. So that is, that is what, that's what it is. It's rare to get, but sometimes you can, through the document, in those dialogues, you can, you can get some understanding of what the African push is about. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nafefe, for this short but very strong lesson of the art of making and uh, writing uh, history with uh, different sources, different sources from different ideologies, different world. We still have a few minutes for some uh, questions. Uh, monsieur, uh, no, 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 le, le monsieur. Excusez-moi, je connais pas votre nom. Oui. Uh... Je suis de la diaspora tunisienne installée en Allemagne. Mm -hmm. yeah. Et notre travail consiste de valoriser, c'est-à-dire le potentiel économique, culturel tunisien, mais en valorisant comment, c'est-à-dire ce potentiel peut être un levier de développement économique. C'est pas, c'est-à-dire, on écrit des livres seulement. Moi, j'ai assisté à plusieurs séminaires. L'année dernière, ça fait deux ans ou trois ans, j' ai assisté ici l'impact socio-économique des Mauresques sur la civilisation tunisienne. Le plus important pour nous, comment rendre, c'est-à-dire, ce qu'on a euh, écouté, c'est-à-dire, ces deux jours, visible et comment valoriser, c'est-à-dire, ce patrimoine. Et je vais vous donner quelques exemples. Vous avez dit le document arabe, le, comment on dit, le manuscrit arabe. On trouve partout. Même en Allemagne, on trouve. Le problème, c'est de dire comment valoriser ce potentiel ici ou là-bas. Ça fait six ans, j'ai assisté, c'est-à-dire avec une chercheuse tunisienne sur le manuscrit arabe. Mais c'est-à-dire, ce n'est pas la méthode, ce n'est pas l'ancienne méthode de recherche classique. Avec un start-up, elle a utilisé l'intelligence artificielle. C'est-à-dire, au lieu de, -à -dire de faire deux recherches et d'attendre, c'est-à-dire deux mois, quelques mois pour avoir le résultat, c'est avec une application, elle fait des recherches. D'ailleurs, c'est-à-dire, cette application, elle lit, mais aussi s'il trouve des feuilles ou des documents ou des pages qui sont c'est-à-dire coupé ou sans machine, c'est c'est-à-dire c'est l'application qui va faire toutes ces recherches. D'ailleurs, c'est-à-dire cette start-up, elle est en train de travailler avec le musée du Berlin concernant le manuscrit, c'est-à-dire arabe et le manuscrit de Tombouctou. Et aussi pourquoi le musée et d'autres, c'est-à-dire après la guerre de la Syrie d'Irak, on a trouvé des manuscrits du manuscrit ancien, mais aussi du manuscrit de certains groupes de Daesh. Comment comprendre et comment, c'est le passé ça, on rentre maintenant dans le, c dans le prison, comment utiliser cette application pour comprendre exactement ce passe, qu'est-ce que se passe. C'est très, très important. Quand, c'est-à-dire, on utilise la technologie pour comprendre le manuscrit, parce que c'est plein, moi, dans la bibliothèque nationale, Plusieurs documents qu'on n'a pas étudiés qui sont là, qui sont là. Jusqu'à quand qu'ils sont là C'est-à-dire c'est de l'or. Et on peut vendre, c'est-à-dire ces informations pour, par exemple, pour, les, pour le, big, le big data. C'est très demandé ces informations-là. D'ailleurs, la dernière, c'est-à-dire application, la dernière révolution dans la technologie, c'est le chap, chap, etc. On demande, c'est-à-dire quelles questions il nous donne, c'est-à-dire, résumer ce qu'on a fait deux jours maintenant. Et je termine. Pour les langues, c'est-à-dire, ou le dialecte, c'est-à-dire, ou les di le dialectes africains, sahli, etc., il y a une autre, il y a une autre société start-up en Tunisie 
qu'elle est en train d'étudier ces langues, mais pour qui C'est pour le télécom. Et pour d'autres, c'est-à-dire au lieu c'est-à-dire d'attendre la traduction, etc., c'est l'intelligence artificielle qui, 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 qui va présenter toutes ces informations et, c'est-à-dire la dernière application, quand vous parlez en votre langage, en votre dialecte, en votre etc., sahli, etc., ensemble, c'est-à-dire on, on, on discute ensemble sans passer par interprète, etc. Je m'excuse, j'étais un peu lent. Le plus important, quand j'assiste, comment valoriser et comment, c'est-à-dire, ce document, ces choses, c'est-à-dire, devient de, 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 des valeurs palpables. Dernièrement, le ministre de la Technologie, ex-ministre, a fait un programme très, très intéressant qui s'appelle Technoriat, c'est-à-dire pour les chercheurs et pour les doctorants, venez ici, on vous finance et on va passer à l'application et non pas à la théorie. Nous sommes là pour, c'est-à-dire, rendre les choses qui sont théoriques vers des choses pratiques et devient, c'est-à-dire, quelque chose palpable et c'est un projet économique et non pas un projet théorique. Je m'excuse, j'étais un peu lent. Oh, non, ce n'est pas grave, monsieur. Merci beaucoup pour votre intervention. Oh. Ça, ce qu'on est en train de faire maintenant, comment l'UNESCO ou d'autres elle essaye, c'est-à-dire, de valoriser soit sous forme de partenariat, soit sous forme du jumelage avec d'autres, c'est-à-dire pays africains, avec d'autres pays européens, mais aussi africains, pour rendre notre richesse à l'échelle mondiale visible. Ça, c'est le plus important pour nous, la diaspora. OK, les Américains, on, on, on connaît, c'est-à-dire le détail de la civilisation américaine, mais la civilisation africaine, il y a beaucoup de richesses qu'on n'est pas en train de le valoriser. Ça, c'est le plus important pour nous. Oui, monsieur, je suis absolument d'accord avec vous. Euh, je partage votre enthousiasme de, de valoriser et faire connaître les, les, les sources euh, en général. En fait, vous avez ici les membres du comité tunisien de Fontes Historie Africaine qui étaient d'être formés. L'un de ses membres, professeur Monsef Abdeljelil, a enseigné en Allemagne, donc il connaît très bien la situation. Donc, euh, je pense que eux, ce sont eux qui, sont, qui, qui peuvent répondre à votre question et qui peuvent mieux réagir, mais je préfère euh, laisser ces discussions après notre intervention, car nous sommes déjà dépassés notre temps. Mais quand même, merci. Euh, il y a encore quelques d'autres Uh, uh, Monsieur Ramzi. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I have um, probably a very short question to Professor Barr, um, as well to... Um, uh, to Professor Barr? Yes. Are you still with us, Professor Barr? As well to the historians among, among us here in the room. Um, is it just what, what is the added value to, to, to go back to those diaries of anthropologists, to, to go back to the um, diaries of uh, um First of all, diaries are personal, they are emotional, and they are subjective. And um, we remember that we have a bad experience with um, Malinowski. He never published his diary, but his wife did, Valeta Malinowski, and then we, we know that he revealed his whole theory. So because he really were not writing the way he was thinking about the trobriance of the Western Pacific. So that's, that's why I'm raising the question, what is the added value of diaries and, and the um, research related to African history? Thank you. Is, uh... well, can you answer, Professor Barr? Did yes, you understand yes, the yes, question? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, uh, I think uh, the answer will be in uh, publication. You must uh, read it uh, to evaluate uh, its value. Uh, I think uh, uh, Czekanowski was a very good educated young scholar uh, who worked with uh, um, very good uh, education um, um, as an author of doctoral thesis in physical anthropology 
And I think uh, uh, that uh, value of this theory will be in uh, your personal uh, opinion about uh, this theory after, uh, after, after, after publishing. This is uh, one possible uh, answer. There are uh, very, uh, very, very uh, difficulties uh, uh, if we want to evaluate uh, these theories uh, during the editorial process. We are emotional <laughs> uh, in this in these theories, so. Uh, I think it is uh, hard to me personal uh, evaluate its uh, scientific value. In my opinion, uh, its value is uh, in a, a great, uh, really great. This is more than 1,000 pages of uh, information, of data, uh, and lists, uh, which are a kind of basis for further studies. I think its uh, values are uh, as uh, a great uh, sources material to evaluate, uh, to assess, and to criticize. So that is my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Barr. Is there any question? If uh, not, uh, I will. I would like to thank to to this uh, panel, and uh, I would like to thank for your questions. And I close the discussion. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, now I will use the opportunity for some uh, final remarks. Uh, uh, normally, it was with. Uh, it was with uh, my colleague, Dr. Mohamed Giagayete, who I wanted to give some final remarks in Nepal. He's now here. So, it won't take long. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to give you a, one important information that all of the contributions will be published. And I hope you will send your uh, inter interventions. The uh, interventions will be published in the Journal of Asian and African Studies, which is published at the uh, Slovak Academy of Sciences. The journal is indexed in a web of science, if this something means for you. Uh, and uh, what is uh, more important, I think that the journal is also open access. So if you if you publish uh, the text, uh, we will we will have a special issue. The Slovak Academy of Sciences. I would like to thank to them, especially to my institute. They uh, reserved a special issue for our conference that will be published in uh, 2024, and uh, the deadline for your text will be September 2023. But I will send you a more detailed information after I come home uh, and uh, manage my, my things. So, uh, pour, uh, pour faire les remarques finales, je vais passer en français. Ça va être plus vite. Uh, je voudrais vous remercier beaucoup pour uh, votre participation et pour votre réaction à l'appel pour notre conférence. Pendant ces deux jours, je, je crois qu'on a vraiment eu des, des interventions importantes qui, qui, qui nous ont enrichi. Et je crois que l'un des plus importants buts de cette conférence a été rempli. C'était la stimulation de la discussion et de recherche. Je sais que l'Afrique est un grand continent très divers. Et on pouvait le voir dans les, dans les discussions particulières, dans les interventions particulières. Euh, si on prend le cadre géographique, euh, on a parlé du Mali, on a parlé du Sénégal, on a parlé principalement du Tunisie, on a parlé de l'Algérie, de côte Swahili, de la Pologne, de la Belgique, de la France. Donc voilà, vous voyez comment vraiment un des grands enjeux ou un grand défi pour euh, 
ce projet Fontes Historie Africaine, c'est de, de comment s'emparer de cette dispersion de sources africaines, ou cette dispersion des sources pour l'histoire africaine. Elle se trouve en France, en Belgique, en Pologne, aux États-Unis. Il y a même des sources qui sont en Chine. Ils sont en, en Afrique, ils sont au Sénégal, en Tunisie, dans les différentes conditions. On a vu euh, hier euh, quelques photos de Timbuktu. Notre cher collègue Mohamed Diagayete nous a projeté quelques, quelques photos. Donc, euh, on a vu aussi aujourd'hui dans l'intervention de Sylvia l'état des archives malgaches au Madagascar. Donc, euh, c'est un grand défi pour, pour le futur. Comment trouver une solution On, on sait que c'est peut-être une vie humaine est assez courte pour rassembler, publier et annoter toutes les sources pour l'histoire africaine, mais on travaille progressive, progressivement. L'autre remarque que je voulais souligner, à part la dispersion, et le, 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 la dispersion géographique, c'est que presque dans chaque présentation, on a vu que une chose est l'identification des sources africaines. Ça, je ne veux pas dire que c'est facile, mais ça peut, c'est réalisable. L'autre chose, c'est la valorisation des sources. La valorisation a plusieurs obstacles. Et je vois deux. Le premier, c'est peut-être le plus vieux, et c'est l'argent, le financement. Oh, chacun de nous a besoin de finances, et il n'y en a jamais assez pour financer la science, surtout les sciences humaines sont assez sous-financées dans le cadre international, pas seulement ici en Tunisie, dans mon pays, on le voit en France, on le voit partout. Mais c'est comme ça comme le monde est. Donc, la deuxième, le deuxième grand euh, défi que je vois dans la valorisation des sources, c'est euh, la capacité des chercheurs de maîtriser des langues. On a vu aujourd'hui sur la présentation de M. Nafefe qu pour qu'il puisse réaliser ce, ce livre. Pour combien de langues vous avez dit Cinq, sept, cinq sept, cent, sept langues pour écrire un livre sur l'histoire africaine. Donc voilà, c'est déjà, déjà très rare de trouver des gens qui parlent euh, des langues et ça, c'est un long chemin pour arriver à, à la publication comme ça. Euh, pour euh, l'un des buts les plus importants de notre conférence était aussi la présentation d'un nouveau comité qui a été créé de notre projet Fontes Historie Africanae. Et c'est le comité tunisien qui se trouve là dans les premiers rangs. Ce comité tunisien a été créé euh, au début de l'année 2023 et est créé de professeur Monsef euh, Abdel Djelil, bien sûr, monsieur le président de Baït al Hikma, euh, Mahmoud Ben Robdan, puis c'est Ramzi Ben Amara et Hedi Jalab et Abdelhamid Henia. Donc, euh, je voudrais vous remercier de vos efforts de créer ce comité et je souhaite que notre collaboration va continuer dans le futur et que va, va apporter des, des résultats importants. Et je vous voudrais vous bienvenue dans notre projet. Donc, euh, allez. Et pour finir, euh, Monsieur le Président Mahmoud Ben Romdan, euh, je ne peux pas trouver des mots. Comment vous faire vous dire merci pour nous accueillir et pour tout l'accueil que vous nous avez donné. Merci beaucoup encore une fois. Et comme c'est la fin de notre conférence et nous sommes chez vous, j'aimerais bien vous inviter si vous voulez nous dire un petit mot. Venez. Monsieur Rudovec, nos remerciements ici à tous, 
sont à vous. C'est vous qui êtes venu, qui nous avez proposé cette rencontre, et vous avez vu que nous y avons répondu spontanément avec beaucoup de bonheur. Nous pensons en notre académie que notre dimension africaine est sous-étudiée nous, Tunisiens, et que nous avons à changer. Votre projet correspond à nos besoins en tant que Tunisiens, pour la Tunisie, mais pour notre contribution à l'histoire africaine. Nous sommes une institution qui croit en l'universel, il y a une partie de l'histoire de l'humanité qui souffre. L'humanité n'est pas entière parce que l'Afrique est réduite dans notre connaissance de son histoire et de sa contribution à l'histoire du monde. Notre devoir commun est d'aider à notre connaissance commune de la contribution de l'Afrique à l'histoire du monde. C'est ainsi que nous voyons notre rôle de contribuer à ce qu'il y ait une humanité, une universelle. Nous avons écouté toutes les contributions. Ce qui se révèle, vous en avez largement rendu compte dans les minutes au cours desquelles vous avez fait une synthèse. C'est très difficile de construire, de rendre compte de l'histoire africaine. Il y a un très grand nombre de handicaps. Très grand nombre de handicaps. Mais c'est en train d'être fait avec beaucoup de courage et d'isolement. Donc il y a un premier immense aspect qui est la connaissance de l'histoire. Il faut aller la collecter, travailler dessus. Et on a vu combien c'était difficile et combien les chercheurs sont isolés. Il y a un sentiment de solitude. Et vous en avez rendu compte ici aussi, vous avez dit qu'on n'a pas connaissance des efforts qui sont entrepris partout. Il y a des efforts. Nous en avons entendu ici. Mais c'est probablement une partie une beaucoup plus grande partie, sans doute, est-elle en train d'être réalisée Nous n'en avons pas une connaissance exhaustive. La deuxième, c'est qu'avec cette matière qui est extraordinaire, il y a un travail de fond qui est en train d'être fait. Elle n'est pas valorisée. J'ai entendu hier le directeur général des archives tunisiennes ce qui nous a dit d'existant sur la politique tunisienne est énorme. Combien de thèses est-il possible de faire à partir de ces matériaux-là Des dizaines de thèses pour construire à partir des matériaux qui, ont, qui sont là, mais qui sont sous-utilisés. Le troisième défi, c'est la recherche. La jeunesse, qui ne demande pas mieux, je crois, c'est ce qui nous a été restitué par ceux qui ont travaillé avec des jeunes, que de travailler sur l'Afrique. Donc, comment mobiliser ces chercheurs C'est un grand défi. Le quatrième, vous en avez parlé, il est du devoir de ceux qui détiennent un peu de moyens de contribuer à faire remonter l'histoire de l'Afrique. Nous nous considérons ici, non seulement comme ayant hébergé cette rencontre, qui est un grand honneur pour notre Académie, qui est une manière aussi de nous adresser à nos jeunes chercheurs tunisiens. C'est important pour nous. Ce n'est pas seulement important pour vous, 
que nous vous hébergeons, c'est important pour nous, Tunisiens. Donc, tout est dispersé. Heureusement qu'il y a l'Union des académies africaines. Heureusement que vous êtes là. Ce que je souhaiterais, et je parle au nom des académiciens et de ce collectif qui s'est constitué, c'est que nous réfléchissions sur tout ça. Ces journées ont été extrêmement importantes pour dire ce que vous avez dit et ce que je viens de dire aussi. Je voudrais vous suggérer, sur les conclusions que vous venez de faire, mais les miennes qui sont les mêmes que les vôtres, c'est que nous tenions une rencontre dans laquelle on discute stratégie, qu'on fasse le diagnostic de tout ça. Et vous l'avez bien fait dans votre présentation, tout à fait en début de séance, et vous en avez bien rendu compte ici, maintenant, en conclusion. Notre souhait, et nous sommes prêts pour cela, à abriter des assises biannuelles, une fois tous les deux ans, mais c'est soumis à votre discussion, dans lesquelles on dresse, on, on est stratégie, c'est-à-dire on fait l'analyse de la situation, on la diagnostique, et on établit des stratégies de collecte de fonds auprès de qui Des stratégies pour mobiliser des jeunes chercheurs partout dans le monde. Des stratégies de quelles sont les priorités qu'on doit faire Bien sûr, au centre, au centre, les Africains. Leur poids dans nos rencontres doit être beaucoup plus important parce que c'est d'eux qu'il s'agit. Et si vous le voulez bien, si vous le voulez bien, sachez que l'Académie tunisienne est disposée à abriter ce grand symposium dont je vous suggère qu'il se tienne dans une année ou deux et que nous ayons des symposiums par la suite qui aient une même fréquence, une fréquence de deux ans ça permet de respirer un peu, et puis ça permet de voir un peu ce qui change et de construire un avenir en commun. Donc, en conclusion, je voulais vous faire de, de part de notre disponibilité, de notre contribution qui va dans le même sens que celui que vous venez de faire ici en conclusion, et de vous dire que pour nous, c'est un grand honneur que vous ayez accepté d'être parmi nous et je voudrais à l'occasion féliciter tous les contributeurs desquels nous avons beaucoup, beaucoup appris, qui ont travaillé dans l'extrême difficulté. Je voudrais, pour terminer, leur rendre hommage et les saluer. Merci beaucoup.